Today we're going to be talking about Title Fight, which is a 16mm short film that my friend Carlo and I made about a boxer. We're going to be covering the concept development, talking about what to expect when we're shooting a 16mm film project, we'll go into some scene and some lighting breakdowns, and then finally we're going to be reflecting on everything and seeing what we can do differently next time to improve as filmmakers. Hey YouTube, so my name is Alex Paton, I'm a cinematographer, a camera operator and also a film photographer, and these are primarily what I'm going to be talking about here on this channel. So I currently live and work in British Columbia in Canada, but I started my filmmaking journey back in Australia about 15, 16 years ago. So I'm going on in my 16th year of filmmaking in some capacity now, ranging from documentaries to short films to narrative projects to commercials, music videos. But I'm currently working on TV movies as a camera operator. This YouTube video to me kind of felt like the right place to kick off with because 16 millimeter film is something that I love. It's a passion of mine and I found myself talking to a lot of people about it and explaining the process on the K3 and some films that I'd shot. So it made sense to sort of package this as my first YouTube video and put it out to the world and see what happens. So the film's called Title Fight. It's a film about boxing and someone's relationship with their sort of struggle for success in the boxing world. The concept for Title Fight came about um, basically because we wanted to shoot 16 mil, we knew that and we wanted to try and find something that wasn't so prohibitive for this camera. So before we get started, it probably makes sense to watch the short. So here it is. I started boxing to impress my father. I was 10 or 12 when he put the gloves on us for the first time my brother and I fighting, flailing away with our eyes closed in the backyard. I beat him. Maybe the first time I'd beaten him at anything. I really needed that, to be noticed, to stand out, to get respect. I decided to become the champion of the world. I shadow boxed all day. I did sit-ups and push-ups till I ate. I wrote in my high school yearbook, I'm gonna knock Oscar de la Hoya on his ass. And then I lost. There were punches I didn't see and ones I did, but they all hurt in different ways. I retired at 26. I never knocked down Oscar de la Hoya. I never even met him. I have sciatica and my elbows hurt. It might not seem worth it, but everything I have, I owe to that moment in the backyard. The sum of all my failures, my shortcomings and my pain, is my place in this world. This family that has grown around me. This opportunity to love and to be loved. And the courage to be who I really am. So Carlo Alcos, a good friend of mine in Nelson, him and I teamed up to work together on this project. Carlo and I wanted to make something that was collaborative. We'd been speaking about a project like this for a while. So he was able to luckily secure a small grant from a local arts fund. And for us, it meant that we didn't actually have to pay out of our own pocket, which was huge. It was a nominal grant for about two and a half thousand Canadian dollars. Uh, and we instantly knew that for the film that we wanted to make, it was gonna be a couple of minutes long, which meant we would probably be shooting five or six rolls of film. So we knew that a decent amount of that budget was already gonna to go to the cost of buying, shooting, developing, and scanning that film. We started digging through some references online. We saw one film uh, in particular called While You Were Sleeping by Anderson Wright, which is this beautiful piece about people who are sort of active once we go to sleep. And it was really heavy focus on uh, sound design and it's a beautiful film. I'll link it in the description, but it got our ideas going to sort of think about how we could implement a similar kind of structure with this camera. We knew that it was a, gonna be a bit of a battle with sound. We can't really have sound sync going at the same time as this camera because the motor drive is so, so loud and it's super, super distracting for audio. So we tried to keep our goal for this film pretty simple. Basically, we just wanted to execute some fundamentals of cinematography well. We all know how important location scouting is and so this film is no different. 
we went down there and we checked out the space. We made sure that things were actually how they were, not how we thought they were. We took photos, we checked out our lens sizing on Cadrage, and we were making sure that everything was in within our lens set, that we were having interesting backgrounds for like these different locations that we were placing our character Jesse into because we knew it was a, a voiceover piece. We knew he was gonna be doing different things, we knew he'd be boxing, we knew he'd be training, and so we just wanted to check out these spaces put some bodies in frames, take some pictures, and make sure that everything was actually gonna marry up to the way that we thought it would. So because this is 16 millimeter film that we we're gonna be working with, we wanted to make sure that we weren't just burning rolls on the day and making things up on the spot. We made sure that we had a pretty clear and succinct shot list for the entire project, and that went scene by scene. I'm no artist, but having a, a line drawing of some kind of figure next to a description of what you're gonna see at that certain point, is monumentally helpful. So Carlo and I were taking it in turns to just check the shot list that we'd written, make sure the shot was good enough or similar enough to what we had there, cross it off and move on. Now, normally I wouldn't do this, but for this project, again, film is expensive. We want to make sure that what we were doing was right and we only had to do it once. And so for this project, using the storyboards, I brought them into the Premiere and just put them on a timeline. We used the temporary voiceover that um, Jesse had written and then we married it up for our sketches just to sort of see what would be happening at what point. And that also got us thinking about the score and we we're able to send that to our composer, Brendan in Sydney, Australia, to be able to have a look at and then to write something because we knew where the crescendo would be because of the voiceover and we knew kind of that we wanted this slow build up the whole way through. And so him being able to visualize that and us being able to visualize that helped us kind of move on to the next step. So in this section, I thought I'd just go through a couple of still images here and just sort of talk about the lighting setups that we used for each of these. So we had our key light coming from screen left here, just hitting his face and um, sort of wrapping around just to the middle of it. There was a Falcon Eyes flex light map, uh, 24RX I think it's called. Uh, and then we just had that complemented with a fill light here on the other side coming from screen right, which was about a stop and a half lower than the key side. So he was still backlit. Uh, we were able to get a sort of a green wrap around here. We felt the green across the other side of the mirror as well. But we got that sort of, you know, that little sort of key outline that you want from the, from the key being on the far side of the light. This one here is a kind of a similar thing. Uh, we also, this one we were keying with our Aperture 600D through a 6x6 full grid cloth, uh, and it was coming from screen left as well. So we kind of, we keyed it with that. It's, there was a fair bit of spill in the room, which if I had more time, maybe I'd clean up. Uh, and that was complemented also with a fill light, which is again, about a, a stop and a half lower. And it was coming from screen right here to sort of give a blue shade across the whole foreground and make it sort of a bit more deep. We had this whole area here that was deliberately negged out uh, that we didn't have any light on to sort of create some depth in shapes and layers. And yeah, and our key light was doing exactly what we wanted it to just by giving us that little rim on the back side. And you know, there's some nice wrap in the fingers here and ultimately creating depth, which is what we wanted. This is, I think my actual favorite shot from the film. And uh, it was pretty simple. It was just the, the Falcon Eyes RX light on a, on a stand on a C stand coming again from screen left here. That was our key light. We actually didn't have a, a fill light here, but we walked a, a neg in. So we just had a neg here. So it was creating all of our, our dark fill. And our key light was able to sort of wrap really nicely, I think around here, which is why it's my favorite frame because you kind of get that little Rembrandt triangle here that we're always looking for. And the key sort of gave us this sort of little kicks around the side that we really like and to sort of wrap around everything for shadows around here, which is, which is what ultimately we like. This one here is kind of our hero shot for the film. It's kind of, I left this light fixture in here on this crop just so that you can see it, but we had a, for our room tone, we just had this sort of falconized light doing this sort of uh, tungsten glow here for our sort of heavy lifting. Then we had a uh, RGB panel in the background here, and that was giving us this blue kick that you see coming from this direction here. See this little blue rim that's sort of on him there as opposed to our tungsten key light coming from above that's wrapping him around this way. Um, it's pretty basic stuff. It's, it's not the world's best scene, but we, we definitely leaned into these colors because of the color palette of this uh, locker here. We sort of, we chose this blue to sort of complement it. It's a little more on the green side than the actual lockers, but that way it gave us all this sort of ambient spill in the, in the mirrors back here as well. And we put a, a neg up here so we could stop the tungsten coming in from the door, uh, which was sort of around a corner here, but I think it works well. I think we chose the color palette based on our sort of our location and our room and I think it did a good job and and yeah, I'm happy with the result. This one was not so much my favorite shot of the of the show. It's one that I really wanted to like, but um, I think I kind of dropped the ball a little bit here. It was it was difficult for me. We ended up using 
for the key it was a, a falconized light mat that we just kind of taped up to the roof up here which was giving us our glow that way but if I had my time again I would love to have cut it off of that back wall there so it wasn't so bright in the background and it could have been a bit darker there but still keying him from inside there and motivating it from an invisible light bulb that we don't see back here sort of thing but um, I went I think a little bit too hard on the red there was a fixture back here that you can't see hitting red out this way and sort of bouncing off everything and then we had a little uh, a little puck light that was just doing all the the blue sort of fill lighting here um, I think in principle this shot works but in execution it doesn't really I think it was I don't know I'm not sure what I did here that I don't like but yeah I think if I had my time again I would just try and be a little bit more sort of intentional with this lighting Carlo took care of the edit for this project it was a bit of a sort of a collaboration in what we were going to do before we started but together we sort of decided that the um, the overscanned look meaning that the previous and the next frame of your of your 16 millimeter reel are sort of displayed and you've got your sprocket holes on the side and it's a pretty obvious look to sort of show everyone that you definitely shot 16 mil we thought that that look was a little bit sort of overplayed i've used it a lot before and i know when i was first getting into film i was super excited by it for us for this project we both sort of decided we wanted to be a little bit i guess maybe more mature than that maybe and just sort of let the film and the textures and the grain and everything that we love about film hopefully do the heavy lifting visually the color grading for this film is something that we definitely didn't want to be too heavy handed on we wanted to get as much as we could right in camera and we wanted to let the film shine as much as possible. We overexposed it all by one stop, which gives us more latitude in the color grading process to be able to sort of play a little bit. The way that it sort of responds to color when you overexpose your image is much stronger. So we did get the scan back in a log format so we could do a full grade on it, which we did do. And I'm so stoked with the results. For me, there's nothing like it when you first start moving those sliders in Resolve and you see your film come to life, it's the best feeling. Because we did a lot of work in pre-production, we kind of had a pretty clear idea of what the edit would have looked like from the first day. And that was really helpful for us to be able to send to Brendan Warner, our sound composer. Brendan for this project was a super obvious choice for us as well because he works so heavily with analog sound. So we sent him the version that had all of our sort of stills from our uh, shot list and a timeline. It had the voiceover ready to go and he went to work doing what he does best and, and started writing a score for it. If you like how this sounds and you want to work with Brendan, I'll leave his contact details below. You can get in contact with him for your own work. So because of the sound constraints of the K3, Carlo had to actually go back to the gym and re-record all of the sounds that you hear. So the bags being punched, Jesse lifting weights, jumping around, and all the textural sounds that actually made its way into the final mix. So in this section, we're going to talk about the considerations of the K3. It's a quirky, weird camera. It has a lot of little things that you sort of need to know about it before shooting it. And that's why testing it out and making sure that you're comfortable with the camera is, is a good idea before you take on any serious shoot. So the camera of choice was the Krasnogorsk 3 or the K3. And we chose this camera because I own one. A YouTuber I've been following for a long time now, Bray Hunziker, he did a really good video about these K3s and about the different offerings and options and everything available about it. He did a deep dive and it's a better video than I could have ever made, so go check that out. I'll leave a link in the description below if you want to find out about all the nitty gritty. But what I'm going to cover here is more of a section about what I sort of had to think about with my K3 going into this project. The K3 takes 100 foot spools of film, not 400 feet. So when you're buying your, your film from Kodak, it's these 100 foot rolls and the daylight rolls they get loaded into the top go through a ribbon go through the gate and then they get taken up into the take-up spool most cameras do that the bolex does that as well uh, but it is a consideration we're buying 100 feet rolls and not 400 feet rolls if you're shooting at 24 frames per second you get roughly two and a half minutes from a 100 foot roll if you're over cranking or under cranking so if you're going faster speeds like 48 frames a second it's going to be twice as fast as that and it goes down and up from there sound after the fact now this is going to be one of the sort of pivotal points of the film because we knew that the consideration of this was that we weren't going to be rolling any on location sound recording. This thing sounds like a freight train at full steam when it's rolling. You're not going to be recording any usable sound with that thing going. When I'm shooting film, I'm always shooting with my light meter. My light meter is my best friend in film sets. It's understanding the sort of contrast ratios that you want to be making. We knew that for this film in particular, it was going to be a dark and sort of a low key kind of look. And so my light meter is a super objective way of being able to show me that without a word of a lie, actual light values so I can dial in my lighting ratios. Screw mount lenses. It uses the Pentax M42 screw mount. And that means I have a wide range of my Takamas available for me to use. 
but it also means that there's no focus rings uh, that can be really functional because when you're winding focus, it's going to spin the focus ring and that's in danger of if you're at minimums of actually twisting the lens off of the mount. The kit lens that comes with the camera is a pretty cool zoom lens. It's a 17 to 69 f 1.9. It's super strange and obscure, but it's not the sharpest lens that I've ever used by a long way. Um, but it does do the job. And I love how it flares, the lens flare is this kind of diamond angular thing that sort of whizzes past the image and it can look really cool in my opinion, especially when you have the lens hood on. For this project I would have loved to have used my Takamas and they did come with us, but time was of the essence and we were playing between loading film and making sure that every, everything was in the right place at the right time, so we didn't end up using them and the actual, the whole film was shot on this. My copy in particular, the widest field of view at 17 millimeters, it does have this kind of not a vignette, but more so just straight up the actual barrel of the lens is in there. So it's this thick black line around the outside and it's this kind of curvature shape. It's not particularly pleasing to look at. You can't really pass it off as a vignette, but it's in some of the shots, so <laughs> it's there. But it is something to consider. My 16 by 9 gate has a strange quirk where on the very right hand screen side, there's a little part that actually isn't in my viewfinder that actually does exist on the frame. And I'll show you a frame here, it's an example of that. When I framed this one up, I wasn't actually in my own reflection through the viewfinder for what I could see. But when I got the film back, I'm obviously blatantly there. So that's just another consideration that I'll have to remember going forward. The eyepiece on this camera kind of sucks. It's a bit of a pain. You have to make sure that you're totally level with it for your eye to see through it properly. And sometimes if there's sun hitting you, it's kind of nasty to look at, but it is what it is and definitely a consideration. NDs are pretty much unusable with these old styles of cameras that are SLRs because as soon as you chalk up an ND in there, you have to see through the eyepiece, which is already wide open. So sometimes if you've got three stops of ND there, it basically renders the eyepiece useless. Monitoring film for this camera kind of sucks as well. It's this spring mount system at the back that leans against the amount of film that you have left, which Touch wood, it's never actually scratching in the film for me, but it's just a really sort of lazy system and it's not particularly accurate. So for this shoot, we actually had Nicky Sharps on his uh, stopwatch and timing each run stop so that we had a ballpark idea of, of how much film that we did shoot during the night. It's not a flawless system though. There was a shot that was quite important where Jesse was leaning on the ropes on the side of the ring. And it was a shot that I thought that I had a couple of different variants on. Um, you can hear the film leader kind of flick through the gate once the film's done and I was waiting for that and I didn't hear it. So I thought that I was still shooting on a film that was there, but it actually wasn't. Um, but at the end of the day, the light leak did come through and we actually used it as a, like a, a real in-camera light leak transition. So it was kind of a happy accident, but I would have liked to have had a few more options of the shot of, of him leaning on the fence. But The crop factor on these lenses is crazy. I think it's like a 2.3 times crop factor. So when you're at a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame sensor, like we normally talk about, on this camera, it's gonna be something like 130 mil, 140 mil or something like that. And so having really wide lenses is really important, like the Pelling 3.5 mil, which we have, but we actually didn't end up using it because um, it just, it showed too much of the world and it's a different look. So we just chose to stick with this lens. Film needs a lot of light. So when I'm using these vision stocks, I'll always overexpose by at least one stop. Sometimes in the snow, I'll overexpose by two stops. But again, there's a video that Lewis Potts, a really strong filmmaker in Australia, uh, spoke about. He goes into his whole uh, color grading process and exposure process for shooting film. I'll leave that link below. When shooting with a K3, you basically need to include a small budget for gaffer tape because every single possibility of light coming into this camera needs to be taped up. Sometimes it's a look that people are going for when they have the light leaks kind of popping in and out, but there's nothing more heartbreaking than getting a roll of film back and just seeing that the back has just flashed everything there is and there's a red bleed through the entire roll of film. It's an expensive mistake and no one wants to make it, so use your tape. Next, we're gonna be talking about the different benefits of shooting the K3 versus other camera systems. There aren't any. Now, that's not entirely true, but this camera is one of the most basic 16 millimeter cameras that there are. It means that you're gonna kind of get the ground level features, but you are able to shoot a lot more film, and that, to me, was really important. Money that you could have spent on a much more expensive camera system is now being put into shooting rolls of film. Where I do think that the K3 shines is it's a small compact film camera. That means you can toss in a backpack, you can go to the top of a mountain, you know, you can hang out of a plane, whatever. 
It doesn't need this big, heavy ecosystem with it, with ACs and big camera support systems and things like that. It's maybe comparable to something like a 35 millimeter point and shoot camera for a film photographer who would otherwise use a big, heavy SLR. It gets you a really similar look and feel because you're using the same film in a much more sort of portable compact unit. I bought my K3s from Max in Russia, who goes by K3 Super 16 on Instagram. I'll leave a description below. But he's a champion. He was super clear about everything. I'm not sure that I'll need a third one ever, but if I do, I'm gonna go to Max for it. In this section, we talk about reflection. And in my opinion, I think it's one of the most important parts of filmmaking. I think in the world that we live in today with Instagram and YouTube and every other resource under the sun, it's really easy to compare yourself against the greats. And I think the strongest comparison that we can make with ourselves is against ourselves. So I want to make some of these YouTube videos a sort of an objective review on my own work for myself and for you guys so that we can all learn as filmmakers together and, and figure out what to do better next time, what we liked, what we didn't like, counting the wins when they happen and just being able to grow as filmmakers. This is the first time that we shot multiple rolls of film in the one sitting. This was the first time that it was kind of, we were monitoring how many rolls we had and we were sort of making sure that everything was checked off in a row. And that's pretty time consuming. The amount of time it took to actually thread up each one and make sure it was totally perfect was a much more of a consideration than I thought it would have been in the pre-production process. Nick did an awesome job in loading the film. It was his first time ever and he didn't screw up on roll, which is better than I can say for myself, but it was a time sucker and it's definitely something we have to consider for next time. I think maybe our shot list was too ambitious for the two nights. We had two evenings that were scheduled five hours each and it was after the gym closed. So we, all of us were starting to fade towards the end of the night, you know, we, everyone's done a full day's work, everyone's tired and, and then we have to sort of produce this content. I think either like lowering the shot list and being a little less ambitious with the shots or giving ourselves an extra night, maybe I think would be a better idea for next time. Having someone just in charge of lights, bringing a gaffer with us to set would have been hugely beneficial as well. We didn't have the luxury of huge crews. But one thing I would change is, is I think someone just in charge of lighting would be able to help me to just see through my lens more and use my light meter more and, and be a bit more focused on the camera part. Me walking over to my light fixtures and changing things and then coming back was bringing me out of it a fair bit and it just also kind of slowed things down. So I don't know how I'd do it, beg, borrow and steal, but I would try and find a budget for a gaffer next time. I think it's a little bit long. It's a film that we built around Jesse's monologue, but I do think that it's a bit long and I think that he was super collaborative with us when he was working and he, he would have totally been fine to cut it down a little bit. It wasn't something that he wrote years and years ago. He wrote it for this and we were all working together. So I think it would have been cool to maybe just trim it down, I would say a third and just have it a little bit of a stronger, succinct piece for next time. I'm actually really happy with the images that we made. So if I was to try and improve on that, I think maybe I'd include some more traditional camera movements. I think if we had, you know, like a Dana Dolly or a Wally Dolly or something simple to be able to do some sort of push-ins on some pivotal moments and some sort of, you know, playing with the ropes and tracking side to side on that and just some basic cinematic camera moves that I think could just have elevated this piece a little bit more. We relied really heavily on the handheld look and it was something that we spoke about from day one. It's a boxing piece, we want it to be energetic, but it's this boxing piece that we want it to be a bit like larger than life and a good way to do that is to sort of promote camera movement. I think maybe as well, the lighting choices that I made, maybe I was a little heavy handed with it. I'm not too sure, but I think if I did have my time again, I would pull colors that were sort of more commonly found in gyms and sort of lean into the tungsten look and lean into the blue look a little bit by these sort of big heavy reds that come out of nowhere and maybe a little too on the nose, but it's all subjective. And I think that's just what I would try and implement next time. So all this said and done, it begs the question, would I use this camera again for this kind of project? Short answer, 100% yes, I would. I own it. It's something that it doesn't owe me any money anymore. I've shot enough film through it to have, I guess, warranted the cost that I paid for it. But the fact of the matter is, film is expensive. And if I was shooting this project again, I would use the camera that I have. Again, maybe I would use my Takuma lenses and I would slow things down and I would be able to swing lenses and pay a bit more attention to this sort of narrative world that we've built. But I think run what you brung. It's easy to compare your cameras against something that's a higher model, but you're always going to find that higher model. And this is what we've got. So we used it and I would use it again. Am I happy with this project? Yeah, I think so. It was fun. I'm stoked that I did it. It got me shooting film more. Are there things that I would change? Yeah, for sure. But from day one, the objective was to shoot a project on film, which we did do. 
I think we got something that was decent out of it and it's sharpening my tools and it's getting me shooting more film and getting me to stay in love with film and I think that's a really important thing and I can't wait to sort of implement everything that I've learned from this one on my next one. Thank you so much if you've made it this far in watching this video. You're an absolute legend. I mean, it's a strange space for me to be in. It's the first of hopefully many and it's YouTube. So you know what to do to help me out. Please give it a like, give it a follow, subscribe. If it's something that you're into, if you got something out of this, share it with your friends and I'll be forever grateful. So I hope to be making many more of these and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.